Hi, I'm Ashley Dobbs. I'm a professor of law at the University of Richmond School of Law, and this is the synopsis. A book was recently published on the law of fraternities and sororities. This project was spearheaded by Gregory Parks, who's a professor at the law school at Wake Forest University. This is an area of scholarly interest, how the law intersects with fraternities, sororities, primarily the Greek letter system in the United States. He asked other professors to help him with this project by writing chapters on their areas of expertise. Mine is intellectual property. So some people might ask, how do fraternities and sororities intersect with intellectual property? Primarily the areas where we would see an intersection is with trademark and copyright law. Fraternal organizations, and that includes sororities, are typically known by their three-letter Greek designation or two-letter Greek designation but they often have other symbols or slogans. Now there are reasons historically why they might not have been protected in the past, but as the organizations grew in the 1900s, uh, primarily in the 30s and 40s, we started seeing increasing interest in protecting those names and symbols of the organizations. And the organizations were also discovering that other people were profiting from their designations and needed to try to control this. So you started to see a rise of fraternities and sororities registering trademarks in their uh, Greek letter designations, their slogans, and other things that they used to identify their chapters. Their primary concerns were infringement from two different directions. As it says in the old movie, the calls coming from inside the house. One of the problems was actually their local chapters. So if, for example, a local chapter got in trouble with the national chapter and had been disaffiliated, they might keep using the nicknames Kappa Sigs, uh, the symbols, and when all attempts to solve the problem internally failed, the national organization sometimes turned to the courts and sued for trademark infringement against the local chapter, leading to interesting case headers like Kappa Sig v. Kappa Sig. The other problem, however, were manufacturers who did not have permission producing goods using the fraternity or sorority's insignia. Now the reason this is a problem is twofold. There's usually a royalty paid when a manufacturer produces items with someone else's trademark on them. So for example, national organizations these days typically have a contract with a t-shirt or sweatshirt company where they agree that that manufacturer will be the sole provider of those goods or services with the fraternity or sorority's insignia on it, and in exchange, they get paid a royalty. So the fraternity or sorority is losing money if they go off and print t-shirts at the local shop and not use the uh, approved supplier, but it also creates a different problem which threatens the very trademark rights of the national organization altogether. There's a phenomenon in trademark called naked licensing, and that is if a trademark owner does not control the quality of the goods on which its trademark is used, and if it does not supervise licensees and does not control the quality of the products, or at least do a quality assurance check. If they allow for the unfettered licensing, their marks have been deemed abandoned. And so a national organization that doesn't control how its, its uh, marks are used on products run the risk of having their marks abandoned altogether. The flip side is how can sororities and fraternities who get the national chapter in trouble by infringing on other people's trademarks themselves. For example, a local chapter decides to host a Super Bowl party or a March Madness party. Soon the national organization is getting letters from the NFL and the NCAA. So these are just two examples of how the intellectual property world intersects with the world of fraternities and sororities. And if you want to learn more about copyright, for example, pick up the book.